Hello, everyone. I am back, and today I'll be recording part two, chapter five. But before I do that, it's actually March 9th, 2022, and I woke up this morning to some interesting news. An expedition called Endurance 22 actually found the wreck of the Endurance, and it's the first time anybody has actually been able to find the wreck. On your screen now is some official footage that they provided of what it currently looks like. There will be some TV shows and some other things regarding the expedition. I'll link to the press release down below in this video's description where you can read more about it. So without further ado, here is Chapter 5. The final loss of the Endurance was a shock in that it severed what had seemed their last tie with civilization. It was a finality. The ship has been a symbol, a tangible, physical symbol, that linked them with the outside world. She had brought them nearly halfway around the globe, or, as Worsley put it, carried us so far and so well, and then put forth the bravest fight that ever a ship had fought before, yielding to the remorseless pack. Now she was gone. But the reaction was largely a sentimental one, as after the passing of an old friend who had been on the verge of death for a long time. They had been expecting her to go for weeks. When she had been abandoned 25 days before, it had seemed that she would sink at any moment. Indeed, it was remarkable that she had stayed on the surface so long. The next morning, Worsley obtained an, an encouraging sight indicating that in spite of four days of northerly winds, she had not been blown back. The pack appeared to be under the influence of a favor favorable current from the south. Hussey, however, had detected a disturbing change in the behavior of the ice. It no longer showed much tendency to open up under the influence of winds from the north. Furthermore, these winds, which in the past had been comparatively warm after blowing across the open seas, were now almost as cold as the winds from the pole. There could only be one conclusion. Quantities of ice, not open water, extended for a great distance to the north. Still, the men showed an, un an astonishingly optimism. The task of raising the whaler's sides was almost complete and everyone was impressed with the job McNeish has done. The shortage of tools and lack of materials seemed not to have handicapped him in the least. To cock the planks, he had added, he had been forced to resort to cotton lamp wick and the oil colors from Marston's artist's box. That night, the first after the sinking of the Endurance, Shackleton sanctioned a special treat, the serving of fish paste and biscuits for supper. Everyone was delighted. Really, this sort of life has its attractions, Macklin wrote. I read somewhere that all a man needs to be happy is a full stomach and warmth, and I begin to think it is nearly true. No worries, no trains, no letters to answer, no collars to wear, but I wonder which of us would not jump at the chance to change it all tomorrow. Macklin's good humor continued into the next day when he and Greenstreet were out seal hunting. They were suddenly taken with the idea of going for a long ride, for a ride along one of the small leads of open water. But they knew that Shackleton, who could not abide unnecessary risks, would be furious if he saw them, so they went some distance away behind a number of pressure ridges. They found a stable little flow and climbed on board, pulling along with the ski poles. They were doing beautifully when they spied Shackleton a short distance away, riding on uh, Wild's sledge. Shackleton caught sight of them at the same time. We both felt, said Greenstreet, like guilty schoolboys caught robbing an an orchard, and immediately paddled for the bank and landed, and went on with our seal hunt, finally meeting him as he returned to camp. Instead of the long harangue, as we expected, he only gave us an awful look and passed on. Shackleton's aversion to tempting fate was well known. This attitude had earned him earned for him the nickname Old Cautious, or Cautious Jack, but nobody ever called him that to his face. He was addressed simply as Boss by officers, scientists, and seamen alike. It was really more title than a nickname. It had a pleasant ring of familiarity about it, but at the same time boss had the connotation of absolute authority. It was therefore particularly apt and exactly fitted Shackleton's outlook and behavior. He wanted to appear familiar with the men. He even worked at it, insisting, insisting on having exactly the same treatments, food, and clothing. He went out of his way to demonstrate his willingness to do the menial chores, such as taking his turn as Peggy, to get the mealtime pot of hoosh from the gallery to his tent. And he occasionally became furious when he discovered that the cook had given him preferential treatment because he was the boss. But it was inescapable. He was the boss. There was always a barrier. 
an aloofness, which kept him apart. It was not a calculated thing. He was simply emotionally incapable of forgetting, even for an instant, his position and the responsibility it entailed. The others might rest or find escape by the device of living for the moment, but for Shackleton, there was little rest and no escape. The responsibility was entirely his, and a man could not be in his presence without feeling this. His aloofness, however, was mental, rarely physical. He was very much in evidence, taking part in all the men's activities. Shackleton, in fact, was one of the early arrivals when word got around on November 26th that somebody in number 5 tents had unearthed a, f unearthed a fresh deck of playing cards. Along with McElroy, he spent hours teaching them how to play bridge. The two instructors could hardly have found more enthusiastic students. Within 48 hours, the popularity of the game reached epidemic proportions. On the 28th, Green Street noted that from each tent may be heard, one club, two hearts, two no trump, double two no trump, etc. Those who didn't join in found themselves almost ostracized. On one occasion, Rickinson and Macklin were driven out of their tent by the crowd that assembled there to play and to gibbets. At the same time, preparations were being completed for the journey to the west. The boats were now as ready as McNeish could make them. Nothing remained except to name them, and Shackleton did so. He decided to honor he decided the honor should go to the expedition's principal backers. Accordingly, the whaler was christened the James Caird, the number one cutter became the Dudley Docker, and the second cutter, the Stancombe Wills, George Marston, the artist, got busy with what remained of his paints and lettered the proper name on each boat. Shackleton also adop adopted Worsley's suggestion that they could call the flow on which they were established Ocean Camp. He then issued the individual boat assignments. He himself would be in charge of the James Caird, with Frank Wilde as his mate. Worsley would captain the Dudley Docker, with Green Street second in command, and Buddha Hudson was put in charge of the Stancombe Wills, with Tom Crean as mate. And so November was drawing to a close. They had been on the ice for just a month, and for all the trials and discomforts, these weeks of primit primitive living had been peculiarly, peculiarly, oh my gosh, peculiarly <laughs> enriching. The men had been forced to develop a degree of self-reliance greater than they had ever imagined possible. After spending four hours sewing an elaborate patch on the seat of his only pair of trousers, Macklin wrote one day, what an ingrate, ingrate I have been for such jobs when done for me at home. Green Street felt much the same way after he had devoted several days to scrapping and curing a piece of sealskin to resole his boots. He paused in the midst of his task to write in his diary, one of the finest days we have ever had, a pleasure to be alive. In some ways, they had come to know themselves better. In this lonely world of ice and emptiness, they had achieved at least a limited kind of contentment. They had been tested and found not wanting. They thought of home naturally, but there was no burning desire to be in civilization for its own sake. Worsley recorded, Waking on a fine morning, I feel a great longing for the smell of dewy wet grass and flowers of a spring morning in New Zealand or England. One has very few other longings for civilization. Good bread and butter, Munich beer, coromandel rock oysters, apple pie and Devonshire cream are pleasant remem uh, reminiscence, reminiscences rather than longings. The fact that the entire party had been kept occupied contributed much to their feeling of well-being, but toward the close of November, they simply began to run out of things to do. The boats were completed and ready to go, a test launching had been held and they had been found entirely satisfactory. The stores for the trip had been repacked and consolidated, charts of the area had been studied, and probable winds and currents had been plotted. Hurley had finished the boat pump and gone on to make a small portable blubber stove for the journey. They had completed their part of the bargain. Now all that remained was for the ice to open, but it didn't open. One day wore on into the next and the pack remained substantially the same, nor was their drift particularly satisfactory. During this period, the winds had been subtly, but never very strong. So the pack continued to move north at the same sluggish pace, about two miles a day. Frequently, even the recreation of exercising the teams was denied them. Often, the ice would loosen somewhat, leaving their flow an island within, with up to 20 feet of open water around it. At such times, all they could do was run the dogs around the perimeter. Worsley wrote, men and dogs exercise around the flow. 
The complete distance is about one and a half statute miles, but to do it more than once proves damningly or damnably mo monotonous to the dogs as much as to ourselves. Time indeed was beginning to weigh a little heavily. Each day blurred anonymously into the one before. Though they invariably tried to see the good side of things, they were unable to fight off a growing sense of disappointment. Macklin wrote on December 1st, We have done a degree of latitude 60 miles in less than a month. This is not as good as it might be, but we are gradually getting north, and so far everything is hopeful. And on December 7th, McNeish ra rationalized, We have drifted back a bit, but I think it will be for our good, as it will give the ice between us and the land a chance to get out and us a chance in. Since abandoning the, endur the endurance, they had covered 80 miles in a straight line almost due north, but their drift had described a slight arc, which was now curving definitely to the east, away from land. Not enough to cause real worry, but enough to stir concern. Shackleton had suffered a bad attack of sciatica, which had kept him confined to the, his tent, and more or less out of touch with things. But toward the middle of the month, his condition improved and he became aware of the growing restiveness among the men. The situation was not improved on December 17th. Just after they had drifted across the 67th parallel of latitude, the wind hauled around to the northeast. The next day's observation showed that they had blown back across it. An air of tension of patience pushed too far, settled on the camp that night, and conversation went, was scant. Many of the men went to sleep, whoops, wrong button, went to sleep right after supper. McNeish lets go of his pent-up frustration in his diary, choosing as his target the profanity of his tentmates. One would imagine he is in a Ratcliffe Highway, a 19th century red light district on the London waterfront, or some other den by the language that is being used. I have been shipmates with all sorts of men, both in sail and steam, but nothing like some of our party. As the most filthy language is used, as terms of endearment, or worse of all, is tolerated. Shackleton was concerned. Of all their enemies, the cold, the ice, the sea, he feared none more than demoralization. On December 19th, as he wrote in his diary, am thinking of starting off for the West. The need for action was settled in his mind the next day as he announced his plan that... keep tapping the wrong thing on my screen here. And he announced his plan that after... There we go. Having some problems turning the page here. That afternoon, he said that on the following morning, he would go with Wild, Hurley, and Crean's teams to survey the country to the west. Their reaction was immediate. Green Street wrote, The boss seems keen to try to strike to westward, as we don't make headway as we are. That will mean traveling light and taking only two boats at the most and leaving a lot of provisions behind. As far as I have seen, the going will be awful, everything being in a state of softness far worse than when we left the ship. And in my opinion, it would be a measure to be taken only as a last resort, and I sincerely hope he will give up the idea directly. There have been great arguments about the matter in our tent. Indeed there were. Worsley felt much the same way. My idea is to stay here, unless the drift should become too uh, large to the east. The advantages of waiting a little longer are that the drift will convey us a part of our journey without any exertion on our part, that probably we should be able to keep three boats, and that in the meantime, leads may open in the pack. But a great many others defended Shackleton's decision warmly. As Macklin put it, Personally, I think we ought to push west as hard as we can. We know that there is land 200 miles west, therefore the pack edge should be somewhere about 150 to 180 miles off in that direction. At our present rate of drift, it would take us to the end of March to reach the latitude of Paulet Island, and even then we cannot be certain of breaking out. Consequently, my view is, make as hard and as far as possible to the west. The drift will take us north, and the resulting direction will be northwest, the direction in which we want to go. Anyway, we will see what they think of things tomorrow.